first of all, welcome, welcome everyone. I wanted to start uh, by acknowledging the country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of, of this country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Welcome to this event. Uh, at the beginning, I will give you a very brief overview of uh, the PACER program, uh, because this, is, this event is uh, the first um, of a series of events that will run throughout June. POSI Center of Extreme Scale Readiness, uh, PACER, is POSI's response to the unique opportunity to help researchers to achieve superior, superior scale and next generation supercomputers. The focus of the PACER program is on both extreme scale research, that means algorithm design, code, code optimization, application and workflow readiness, as well as using the computational infrastructure to facilitate research for producing world-class scientific outcomes. PACER provides researchers with an opportunity to optimize their codes and workflows suitable for next generation supercomputers and Cetonix poses next supercomputer. It is designed as a minimum three-year partnership for collaboration with POSI, HPC vendors, by providing early access to supercomputing tools and infrastructure training and exclusive hackathons focused on HPC supercomputing performance at scale. PACER projects are also provided with co-funding for PhD and postdoctoral positions to work on technical aspects of their projects and build supercomputing experience and expertise, expertise within their groups. PACER projects will demonstrate throughout the the, um, the, the, the project itself, the significant performance improvement between existing Australian supercomputers and next generation supercomputers, significant power efficiency improvement in terms of performance per watt. So the, the amount of compute we can do for a single watt uh, of energy, superior capability improvement for the whole scientific domain and ability to achieve previously unavailable computational data processing or visualization scales. 10 research projects were successfully granted access to the POSI uh, Center for Extreme Scale Readiness, establishing Australia's research platform for extreme scale computing. There are some amazing statistics behind PACER that I would like to share. We have 10 projects, 18 institutions, including US national labs and industry partners involved. We have 70 plus researchers working in PACER 10 plus POSI supercomputing experts supporting projects, and we'll create 10 plus new positions uh, working on technical aspects of those projects. Those are the numbers that we are mostly proud of. POSI is hosting a series of seminars throughout June, showcasing the first cohort of PACER research projects. The first in the series uh, focuses on uh, material science and showcases uh, Professor Deborah Bernhardt from the University of Queensland and Dr. Giuseppe Barça from the Australian National University. Before I go introduction of our today's speakers, few opening remarks. Uh, today's presentation will go for around 15 minutes, which will provide a Q&A session of around 15 minutes, but after both presentations. Please post your questions in the chat. There might be answered during the session by POSI staff or presenters, and then at the end we'll also uh, go through some of the questions and, 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 and try to answer those. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Debra Bernhardt. Professor Debra Bernhardt is an ARC Australian Laureate Fellow in the Australian Institute of Bio for Bioenergy and Engineering and Nanotechnology and School of Chemistry and Molecular Bio Bioscientist at the University of Queensland. She's a fellow of the Royal Australian Chemical Institute and a fellow of the Australian Academy of Sciences and was the recipient of the Association of Molecular Modelers of Australasia Medal in 2017. Deborah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marche, for your kind introduction and, and also for Karina for her great organization and the opportunity to present some of our work related to the, the uh, uh, PACER project here. Um, so I'll share my screen if that's okay, and hopefully that will work. Okay, can you see that okay? Good, great. 
Okay, so our PACER project is called Viscous uh, for vastly improved software for Kuwait flow simulations. Uh, the CIs on, on the team were Emily Carl, Shern T, uh, Charlotte Peterson and myself, but it's also done in collaboration with other members of my group, including Ming Chao Wang and Stephen Sanderson in particular, and you can see the other members here. Um, so what I'd like to do today would be very briefly just give you a bit of an overview of the work we do in our group uh, and then talk about the actual project that we're going to be working on um, for the PACER project. What motivated us to look at this particular problem and um, what we hope to be able to do. Okay. So our group is interested in various things, development of theory, particularly statistical mechanics of non-equilibrium systems, development of algorithms in order to, to look at these types of things, and then modeling uh, various systems using conventional methods or some of the new methods that we've developed using quantum mechanical DFT and MD simulation. So most of our development area is around the, the MD side of things. So the sorts of problems that we've been looking at recently in the sort of materials area is looking at bilayers for nanoelectronic applications, um, 2D materials for um, sustainable energy, so particularly battery materials, anodes, cathodes, um, looking at catalysis, doped uh, materials uh, to improve catalytic behaviour, and then the growth of 2D materials. As well as that, Sorry. As well as that, we're interested in um, transport. And some of the systems that we're, we're interested in here are looking at um, the behavior of molecules uh, in nanopores when the pores are, are perhaps being sheared, uh, looking at diffusion or conductivity of ions in solids, um, as super ionic conductors, diffusion of water in zeolites and uh, aggregation of um, phases. This is a polymer ionic liquid system uh, and seeing how the, the concentration of the ionic liquid will change the glass transition temperature, for example. Uh, also looking at uh, systems where we've got different um, materials for supercapacitors. So we look at quite a wide range of different problems. And the, the thing which ties them all in together, I guess, is the fact that we're looking at these systems at the molecular level. So if we want to look at, at bulk systems, this involves very many uh, particles, which means our simulation times are usually quite short. And so being able to use supercomputers to ex expand the size of the systems that we can look at and also look at in increase the time scales is something which is um, very important. Okay, so that's background to what we generally do. So the PACER project um, scientific title was Towards Molecular Level Understanding of Flow-Induced Physical and Chemical Processes. So why are we interested in this in particular? So flow in systems is, of course, important in, in many, many applications. Uh, some of them might be mechanochemistry, and this can be where forces are placed on molecules simply because of the flow field that they're in interested in lubrication in many applications and particularly um, systems where we've got uh, um, spacing between the, the system being very small, so nanoporous systems. So we've looked at some of those systems. MEMS where flow can introduce a response in a um, electromechanical system. Looking at structural assembly and the pictures I have here are from uh, Colin Raston's group where he was using flow to assemble these really interesting structures and that's work published in Al Habi et al uh, that's cited down here. Uh, injection, so looking at flow through a small capillary, extrusion, produce, production of polymers, for example, and mixing. So many, many different applications where it's important to understand flow. So what is the computational challenge here? At looking at these systems at the molecular level, we might have uh, systems with charged particles or partial charges, and the systems are undergoing flow. So the next little bit of the talk, I'd like to just concentrate on some of the, the challenges that, that we have, or what the, the main challenge we want to address for this project. So here are just uh, some um, 
schematics of two different types of flow. In the first one, we have Poisse flow, which might pre represent the flow of a fluid through a pipe or in a slit pore. Uh, or we have co Couette flow here, where we've got, um, say, this wall at the top moving in one direction, the wall at the bottom moving another direction. So we get a somewhat linear velocity profile across this, this pore. Uh, if we want to model these at the molecular level, say in the Poisson flow, we'll have some equations of motion for the wall particles, which are just Newtonian equations of motion. And we have um, the equations of motion for the fluid, well, where as well as the intermolecular forces represented by capital Fi on each particle, we also have a field which is pushing the particle. So this is mimicking the effect of, uh, say, a density or a concentration gradient. So we've got a, a field pushing these particles through the system. In Couette flow, we can do similarly, oh, sorry, we also have a field. So if we apply a field, it will do work on the system, it will generate heat, and we need to thermostat the system. And, and the equations of motion are, are modified in some way in order to um, extract the heat that's being generated. With Couette flow, we could model it in this way with these equations of motion for the fluid particles, just Newtonian. But in this case, we're moving the wall with this field. And again, we have a thermostatting type term just applied to the, the walls in this case, although we could apply it to the fluid as well. Okay, so you can see here, if the uh, fluid is flowing, it will come out of this, this region here. And so in order to treat that computationally, we'll have periodic boundary conditions. So when the fluid flows out of this, uh, over this boundary, it will flow, uh, an equivalent particle will come in. So the number of particles in this, um, simulation cell will, will stay fixed. And we have this infinitely in every direction. And so we can do that for both those systems. But it's not always convenient to model these flow with the walls explicitly in there. And that's particularly the case for, for Couette flow. Having the walls there will change the, um, the density profile across this fluid. It won't be uniform. Uh, we'll have a buildup of particles close to the wall in a, a particular region. And so the walls are actually uh, affecting the, the um, structure of the fluid and the density of the fluid. And so if we wanted to model a bulk system, this would not be appropriate. We'd need to have a very, very large simulation cell. And um, decades ago, NEMD methods, non-equilibrium molecular dynamics methods, have been developed to be able to model this in a homogeneous way in periodic boundary conditions. So we have a periodic system to model a bulk fluid, and we actually only need to simulate a central cell. I've only got two particles here, but this would be typically thousands of particles. We model the, the central cell and the um, systems treated by bulk by having it periodically replicated in every direction. So there's no inhomogeneities introduced due to the presence of walls, and the system, the, the behavior will converge with the number of particles much more quickly than if we had walls. For short-range um, interactions between the particles. So each of these particles has a force due to all the others, but we can cut off those forces if those uh, forces are um, short range. So we can truncate the, the potential, if you like, uh, about a region about the, the different particles. But not all uh, forces are short ranged. Um, the Leonard Jones particle uh, interactions are, um, but Coulomb interactions, electrostatic interactions are not, and lattice sums like an Ewald summation is reduced, is introduced to account for the long range interactions of this periodic system. Now, this is well established. Um, it's been parallelized in various codes, uh, including um, LAMPS, Gromax, and it's been um, parallelized using GPUs as well. And there's adaptations for 2D systems. So this is something which is very well established and um, is being implemented on uh, computers around the world. But what happens when we move to a flowing system? So here, I'm just representing this as a region of the bulk system, which is undergoing Couette flow. So you can see sometime later, the pink particles have moved to the right, the blue particles have moved to the left, and we've got this new arrangement of the bulk system. If we modeled this initial system as a periodic uh, system um, initially, 
and then looked at this sometime later. This is the new arrangement of the particles sometime later. And if we had tried to apply this, this cubic or this square grid to that system, we can see that it's no longer periodic. So we need to have uh, different periodic boundary conditions like these sliding uh, periodic boundary conditions where different layers slide with respect to each other. Or we can have it that we have tilted boxes like this. And again, we have a, a periodic representation. The first case is uh, Lee's Edwards boundary conditions. The second is referred to as triclinic uh, periodic boundary conditions. And both these methods are used in various codes. In lamps, in, for example, triclinic periodic boundary conditions are used for those familiar with that code. Okay, so the, the, the issue is, is that although the code has been, uh, many of the codes have been um, parallelized well and um, developed to run on GPUs for systems with this um, orthogonal grid, this cubic grid. Um, when you have these triclinic periodic boundary conditions, that, that's not the case. And the code is much slowed down when you have long range interactions uh, and you have these um, boundary conditions which need to be applied. So this is just an example of some of the homogeneous equations of motion that have been used to model uh, different systems. And um, thanks to Stefano Bernardi, a previous postdoc, and now at Sydney University, who's done the simulations and the, and the movies. So we can play those movies. And this is an expansional flow. Second one is elongational flow. The third one is the Kuwait flow that we're going to be interested in. And then we have a, a rotational flow. And we just modify the equations of motion in various ways in order to generate different flow fields uh, with thermostat. And we apply periodic boundary conditions which are commensurate with the type of flow that we're looking at. In the first case, the um, simulation cell remains cubic, but in the other three cases, you can see that you end up with, with tilted um, boxes. And so for all these types of systems, the improvements that we hope to make to the code will apply. So I was motivated to, to look at this a little bit further from a, a project we did a few years ago, which involved a collaboration with uh, researchers at the um, Air Force Research Labs in Ohio. Um, and also my postdocs, James and Tanglor at the time, some students from Korea and um, Jenna Fine's supervisor at Clark Atlanta University as well. And they were interest, we were interested in looking at polymers for 3D uh, printing and looking at how the viscosity of the polymers varied with temperature and with composition. This was the polymer that we were looking at, um, PT, uh, and it was a, a, um, a mixture of the PT and APB before the polymer was cured. And we were interested in looking at the viscosity of this system. So this is just some details of the types of simulation that we were doing, um, number of particles. We had Leonard Jones forces plus um, Coulombic interactions between different sites of the, the polymer um, and APB. And um, we used fairly um, standard simulation techniques. And when we were able to calculate the viscosity of these um, mixtures, where n was equal to two and eight, and we had 56 um, polymers of length two and um, uh, 20 of length eight. And these are the results we obtained for the viscosity and the shear dependent viscosity of these polymers. We used non-equilibrium simulations, won't go into the details here, but we were able to predict this shear dependent viscosity and also we can extrapolate to the zero strain rate, shear rate, uh, and do equilibrium simulations using green Kubo relations. And we got the results and they're all in good agreement, which was which is great. These were some preliminary results that um, Hilma Kernan had, had obtained at AFRL. Um, and the viscosity wasn't too bad given the um, fact that we don't know exactly what the we, I didn't, you know, the simulation wasn't mimicking exactly the, the composition of the experiment. So we got good results, 
But this took a lot of computational time. And when I presented this work at um, the ACS meeting in Orlando a couple of years ago, the, one of the conclusions was that the all-item model was not fast enough to do screening. So what we wanted to be able to do would be to screen different polymers, different lengths, uh, in order to select what um, polymer we would use in the experiment. But it was simply took a lot of computation time and um, was not an efficient, effective way of doing things. So it, it was, we sort of stopped the project at that point and didn't consider different compositions and different conditions. So that motivated us to try to develop a faster way of modeling these systems undergoing flow with charge interactions. And the project that we chose to look at um, for the PACER project was looking at the assembly of graphene oxide membranes uh, using its shear. So again, taking a system undergoing cuet flow with charges, partial charges in the system and seeing if we were able to get large enough graphene oxide um, sheets to, to get a good representation. So this was quite motivated by some um, work shown here, um, published in 2016, where they were using shearing in order to align the graphene oxide um, flakes and produce membranes, which were then used for water pur purification. So there were some simulations of this. But what we're really interested in is modeling this alignment process by doing the shearing, seeing how it will vary with the um, type of graphene oxide, because that covers a wide range of different uh, materials, different sized um, oxide flakes and different um, conditions. So that's what we were looking at. We want to be able to model these much larger flakes as well over reasonable times so that we can get alignment uh, using this Kuwait, um, periodic flow where this simulation box changes shape. Okay, so finally, I'd like to acknowledge the people that have contributed to the work I've presented today, um, particularly the Pawsey Computing Centre and staff but also ARC and um, AORD and RCC and NCI, my collaborators and my group for the work that they're, the, the, and the help that they've given with the work I've presented today. So thank you very much also for your attention. Um, thank you very much, uh, Deborah, for, uh, for your inspiring talk. Um, I will now, Maybe just remind that uh, if you have any questions, please pose them in um, in the chat. We will try to uh, try to go back to those questions after um, the second talk. And for the second talk, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Giuseppe Barça. Uh, Dr. Giuseppe Barça is a lecturer in high performance computing in the School of Computing at the Australian National University. In 2020, as part of the uh, Games uh, ECP, so Exascale Compute Project. Uh, Giuseppe broke the world uh, record for the largest hard fox simulation uh, or calculation using over 26,000 NVIDIA uh, V100 GPUs on the Summit Supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Labs in the US. Giuseppe's main research focus is on uh, development of high performance computational science algorithms for cutting edge HPC systems such as exascale supercomputers. Uh, Giuseppe, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Maché, for the very nice introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. I have to do this in two steps, I think, and then maximize my screen. Okay. I think now you should be able to see this. Um, Okay, as I was saying, thanks for the introduction. Today, I will give you a high level overview of this PACER project, which involves the development of a high performance uh, piece of software called uh, the Extreme Scale Electronic Structure System and its application to a set of grand challenge problems that fall uh, under the umbrella of the so called nanomaterial characterization uh, bottleneck with sweeping ramifications in academic research and industry. Uh, let me just briefly uh, introduce my research and my group, given that Maciej has uh, already done a very good job. Uh, the group now includes um, 
six students and the research adjunct. I am a lecturer in high performance computing and my research focuses on the development of uh, novel algorithms and software that can efficiently utilize uh, cutting edge supercomputers such as pre-exascale and exascale systems. Uh, current applications of our research are in uh, computational chemistry, bioinformatics, uh, computational maths and uh, machine learning and pure HPC, uh, for example, for a performance evaluation of programming models or novel pieces of hardware, which are always keen to try out. Let me also introduce the research team for this PACER project. Uh, this is a large uh, multi-institutional project with, with five uh, national partner institutions, uh, Monash, Deakin, Flinders, uh, Sydney, and the ANU, uh, and two international partners, uh, the Ames and the Argonne National Labs, uh, and of course, uh, POSI as well. Uh, the expertise of the partners who are all world leaders in their field uh, spans uh, a broad spectrum of disciplines, uh, which include quantum chemistry uh, method development, uh, mainly with Peter Gill and Professor Mark Gordon, um, high performance computing algorithm and software, uh, and quantum chemistry application and molecular modeling uh, with associate professor Katya Pass and with uh, Professor Tiffany Walsh. Why do we have such a big team? The reason is that Excess is not just another application project. Um, our vision is much broader and longer term. Uh, this project aims to be the beginning of a framework for a continuing community-wide effort to develop a molecular modeling capabilities that by fully and efficiently using the largest supercomputers on the planet can tackle a broad range of challenge problems in chemistry, biology, and material science that would be otherwise unsolvable. We aim to establish a long-term partnership between POSI, the ANU, and the other affiliate institutions with a focus to create a world-class high-performance computational chemistry consortium that will foster and support excellence and discovery in research across a broad range of areas from high-performance computing to material science, biology, and chemistry. In this regard, the PACER initiative is the spark that starts up uh, all this machinery. Uh, in terms of practical feasibility, the project leverages the existing software development effort as part of one of the US DOE funded exascale computing projects, namely the games exascale computing project. This is an over 8 million US dollars project of which I am one of the partners uh, that the DOE funded to um, develop computational software that is able to solve challenge problems uh, in chemistry by using the impending exascale machines in the US uh, frontier at the Oak Ridge National Lab and Aurora at the Argonne National Lab. Uh, but our priority is really to enable uh, researchers to tackle problems that are currently technologically out of reach. And to enable the rapid uptake of this technology, Exes will be developed as a library uh, initially interfaced with two of the most widely used quantum chemistry packages, which are games uh, and QCAM. Our vision directly translates into the practical goal that Exes must be able to predict the chemical properties of large molecular systems, which are the challenging ones in terms of computational resources, with an accuracy that rivals experiments. In fact, these systems, uh, uh, these larger systems where by large, I mean essentially over a thousand atoms, have become pivotal to the development of a broad spectrum of application areas, uh, some of which are here on the slide, um, that require these extreme scale capabilities of excess. These areas include, for example, biology and medicine through uh, the drug design uh, or the study of drug binding and biological interfaces, the development of new nanomaterials and the physical chemical characterization uh, of their interfaces, uh, which has ramifications in a huge number of technologies. And also, for example, uh, the design of new heterogeneous catalysts or the improvement uh, of existing ones, uh, which also is another uh, key development area with a huge impact on the fuel industry uh, and on the production of fine chemicals. 
uh, this hopefully gives an idea of the kind of impact that the project can have. Okay, so it's relatively easy to state that we need to develop software with these amazing capabilities. Uh, it is much harder to find a pragmatic way to achieve these capabilities. Um, in fact, we can really rely on widespread methods such as, for example, QMMM or DFT to solve these problems. All these methods will fail to provide our required accuracy. And this is a known problem, which is well documented in the literature. An additional problem is that there is a dearth of uh, force fields that can accurately model non-covalent interactions in complex media, such as those of bio and nano interfaces. This means that the first step uh, to solve these uh, size and accuracy challenges is to develop a method that is sufficiently uh, general uh, um, generally applicable, I would say, and that performs um, a high accuracy quantum mechanical modeling of these large uh, size molecular systems at the same time. Well, such a method will be difficult to, uh, to develop because of two main obstacles. Uh, the first one is that the amount of computation required to solve the Schrodinger equation to the level of accuracy that we demand scales really badly uh, with the number of atoms in the molecular system. And the second is the inability uh, of quantum chemistry algorithms and methods uh, as traditionally designed to efficiently utilize pre-exascale and exascale level technology. Hardly any quantum chemistry software is able to scale uh, on these platforms. In the interest of time, I would like just to give you an idea of the scalability obstacle. Uh, in this table, I listed the hierarchy of quantum chemistry methods. Uh, from the top to the bottom, they go from the least accurate to the most accurate. Uh, now, even the basic method in quantum chemistry at the top of the table, which is the Arfifoc method, scales formally as the fourth power of the number of atoms in the system, and it yields only a qualitative accuracy. Uh, in order to reach the level of accuracy that we require, we will need to go in the range between the MP2, which scales quintically with the system size, to the range of coupled cluster methods such as uh, up to, I would say, uh, CC, oops, CCSD uh, parenthesis T, uh, which scales haptically uh, with the system size. So how do we overcome these challenges? We combine three technologies. Uh, the first is about the software and the hardware components. Of course, we will use cutting edge high performance computing systems, but this is not really even nearly enough. In order to efficiently utilize these systems, we will use AP HPC programming techniques and algorithms developed for exascale machines. They use a mix of CPU and GPU graphic processing units to accelerate the computation. And we are in part inheriting these from the ECP project. Second, we will actually use high accuracy quantum chemistry methods such as um, spin component scaled MP2 up to CCS uh, D parenthesis T, although SCS MP2 will probably already deliver, we believe, the level of accuracy that we require. The problem here is that, as I mentioned before, these methods may not parallelize well, but most importantly, they have prohibitive scalings. And this is where the third technology comes into play. We will use fragmentation methods that by breaking the molecular system into fragments, uh, at the same time, enable to achieve massive parallelism and to lower the scaling uh, of these computations from the absurd quintic or haptic scalings to a worst case scenario of a quadratic scaling with system size. Okay, I'm telling a compelling story, hopefully, uh, but you may and should ask, does this idea work? Uh, here are some results that we obtained with the access code, ba access code base on the Summit supercomputer in 2020, when Summit was still the number one system uh, in the top 500 list. Uh, using these 150 petaflop monster uh, we were able to break the world record for the largest 34 calculation, as Mache mentioned before. We used over 26,000 uh, NVIDIA GPUs, 
uh, to calculate the atrifog energy of a system which had over 60,000 atoms, uh, where the previous world record was around 11,000 uh, um, 11, atoms. What you see in the plot on the left-hand side is a strong scaling analysis, which essentially is the speed up with respect to the number of nodes um, and where the percentages indicate the parallel efficiencies uh, achieved. Now you might wonder, this is only archery fog, and I just told you that archery fog is not uh, a quantitative method. Uh, so we coded up the MP2. Uh, what you're seeing are results that are yet unpublished. Um, we are still actually producing some of them uh, for the SC21 conference, but I decided to give you a preview. Uh, we broke again the world record this time also by far. Uh, we treated the polypeptide with 45,000 atoms correlating over 180,000 electrons. Uh, for the experts, the overall system had about uh, 2 million uh, basis functions. Uh, to demonstrate the efficiency of this uh, code that we will develop, and we are, it's in part already developed, uh, on the new POSI system, we will use it to tackle a challenge which was identified uh, as a key bottleneck for the future uh, development of nanotechnology, uh, which is the chemical characterization of nanomaterial interfaces. In fact, uh, and of course, uh, interfaces are critical in determining the properties and the functionalities uh, of nanomaterials and therefore the ability to characterize and ultimately to manipulate uh, such interfaces uh, is paramount for uh, processes which are central to industry, uh, starting from energy generation and fuel production to drug delivery and many others. Now, due to challenges which are typically related to surface contamination and defects, there are currently no broadly applicable uh, and robust experimental characterization techniques uh, in liquid or complex environments for these interfaces. And this is where our electronic structure theory calculations will offer uh, a complementary pathway to gain these much needed and scarce uh, details on the structures and energetics of nanomaterial interfaces. Uh, we will focus on the interfacial chemistry of boron nitride, uh, which is an ideal example of a solid material that has a multitude uh, of current and potential new uses uh, in industrial processes. And we will consider two application themes. Uh, first, the absorption of bioRELEVANT molecules, such as amino acids and peptides uh, on boron nitride surfaces, and the exfoliation properties of these interfaces. Uh, second, uh, the usage of boron nitride nanoparticles as drug delivery systems. Um, just a few details about theme one. Uh, in this theme, we will use our uh, extreme scale calculations to obtain the first uh, definitive data set of interfacial absorption energies and geometries uh, for a suite uh, of um, uh, industrially relevant biomolecules. Uh, this will be per se a big step forward in the field that will ultimately lead to uh, the design of nanomaterials uh, either with improved adhesion properties or with enhanced uh, catalytic properties. We will also perform calculations using multi-layered boron, uh, boron nitride nanosheets and study the process of exfoliation of these materials with different exfoliating agents. Um, which will lead to insight on the exfoliation properties and therefore uh, to more efficient exfoliating agents and more effective industrial ex exfoliation processes uh, of which Professor Walsh is an expert. We will also use uh, energy, uh, our energy data that we produced uh, to produce force fields, uh, which will be tailored to deliver high accuracy dynamics uh, for use in larger scale molecular simulations. Uh, so this will provide the community uh, with the tools necessary for performing accurate simulations on these interfaces uh, with far reaching ramifications in science. And let me just say a few words about theme two. Here we will study the use of boron nitride nanoparticles as drug delivery systems. Um, it has been shown that these particles have a high potential for, for as, a, as a drug delivery vehicles. 
uh, in this challenge team, we will study the mechanism of dissociation of proline-rich proline um, antimicrobial peptides uh, for, from boron nitride nanoparticles in explicit water. I don't have the time uh, uh, probably to give mu much more details on this. Um, so I will conclude uh, saying that solving each one uh, of our grand challenge problems will provide a different kind of insight, uh, which was all previously uh, computationally unattainable uh, on the physical chemical behavior of boron nitride interfaces uh, with potentially myriad of uh, applications that can stem from the design and the development of nanomaterials which have either improved adhesion properties or enhanced catalytic properties or promising uh, drug delivery properties. Um, and with this, I will be happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you, Giuseppe, for, for this great talk. Um, let's now go into the, the question session. Uh, we have received one question in the chat. So uh, that, that was to a uh, question to Debra. Um, so Debra, your thermostat protocol ensures that your simulations don't gradually heat up. But uh, in the corresponding experiments, what is known about the temperatures which are generated? Yeah, so that, that's a, a very good question. And um, the answer depends on the application that you're looking at, I guess. Um, so a lot of the simulations, uh, so some of the simulations are where you've got flow occurring, uh, you actually run the simulations at very high, say, strain rates and extrapolate to, to a lower value uh, because the time, the, the, if the strain rate is too um, low, the response is very small. So we often have to ramp up our fields, which will mean that the system heats up a lot more than in a real experiment, experimental system. And so in those cases, it's good to apply a, a homogeneous thermostat just to keep things down. The heating is um, as a field squared. So if you haven't got too high a fields, the heating um, can be represented by some sort of a homogeneous thermostat. Of course, if you've got a system where the flow is actually cre creating a temperature gradient, then that's a different story. And we can uh, either then go back and use the walls um, and actually thermostat the walls like in a real experiment, or which would then um, destroy the periodicity of the, the system. So we'd have to treat that differently. Or we could put some, some local um, thermostatting re regions within our, our system, which allow the particles to heat or cool down. So we don't have to thermostat all the particles. And I guess the, the answer is, it depends on um, what problem you're, you're treating. Uh, if you really want the temperature gradients to be there, or whether the temperature gradient is so small that treating it as homogeneous is better than just allowing the, the whole system to heat up. Um, yeah, experimentally what's known, it's very hard to, to um, determine a temperature gradient across a system without perturbing it. So simulations are a good way of, of modeling that actually. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, I actually have a question to, to Giuseppe as well. So, in the context of the, the ECP, so Exascale Compute, Compute Project, there are various Exascale uh, supercomputing platforms that are being prepared in, in US. One which is um, very similar to Cetonix, which, which is a nice alignment between the, 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 our project and your involvement uh, in ECP. But what are the impl implications for software development techniques um, that you are looking at? Uh, because I understand that this the, the work that you are doing with an ECP is to provide them a, a software at the end, the software or simulation so solutions that can be used on uh, various platforms. So what are the programming models you, your project is currently using and will use in, in future? Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a very interesting question. Um, there, is, um, there has been a, a plethora of uh, programming models which has been developed in order to 
um, enable uh, developers to to actually uh, run the calculations on these systems with the, the main issue being uh, essentially efficient uh, usage of GPUs. And um, unfortunately, as, as uh, probably you're aware, Maché, the, the, the issue here is that each vendor <laughs> uh, promotes their own, uh, their own programming model. And so it, this is actually um, a, a, strange, a strange situation. The approach that uh, our group has taken is to avoid, um, avoid doing any sacrifices in performance. So we tend to use the vendors um, programming models for AMD, we will be using heap when we use, when we are on uh, summit, we are using uh, Nvidia, uh, well, sorry, CUDA Nvidia. Uh, and when, when we'll be on Aurora at the moment, we think that the closest programming model, the programming model that, that is closest to give us the peak performance that we want to see is going to be uh, DPC++, so essentially SQL plus uh, the Intel uh, libraries. So in that sense, um, the um, uh, yeah we we will have uh, that will also I would say maximize our portability, but not uh, in a way that uh, hopefully affect performance. Okay, thank you, thank you, Giuseppe. And actually, we we just received one another question to you as well. Uh, so the question is, uh, those scaling. Uh, numbers are really amazing. What are your strategies for trying to reduce the cost of calculations on large surfaces and periodic boundary conditions? Is fragmentation possible? Uh, yes, so um, that's a, another very good question. Uh, in terms of periodic boundary conditions, um, our approach is actually to scale the system up. Uh, we will not apply for the systems that, you, that I just mentioned uh, periodic boundary conditions, uh, we will fragment those systems and uh, uh, reach uh, conditions where um, uh, all our interactions with the set of, of molecules that we are studying uh, will reach their uh, uh, asymptotic regime. Um, so that's uh, what we are going to do. Um, in terms of other systems which uh, potentially cannot be fragmented, such a, which are not the ones that we um, we are talking about uh, for the project, such as boron nitride, um, but systems which are metals, uh, there is a, a plan for the future, but uh, it's a longer term plan to develop also code that will be capable uh, to exploit the periodic boundary conditions in that case. Okay, thank you, Giuseppe. I have one another question. I think it's both for Debra and Giuseppe. And when Debra, when you were uh, describing the grand challenge problem for, for Pacer, you have mentioned the importance of testing uh, systems under various conditions and the various parameters. Uh, can AI or machine learning techniques be of any help here uh, in augmenting classical supercomputing simulations in both of your projects? Okay. Um, yes, I, I, I think it can be, um, but I think the, the challenges that we are looking at at the moment are things where that would be difficult to, to apply them. I mean, things like developing the force fields using artificial intelligence and things like that, I think would be very valuable. Um, and for the screening of the systems, if we could get enough data available. But I think that that would be a completely different um, computational study. Um, and, but we could use, if we were able to get um, simulations running quickly enough to generate input for um, artificial intelligence machine learning, that would be very valuable, I, I think. At the moment, these, these timescales and the, the calculations are so expensive that just to get one data point is, is difficult. But yeah, I think that it would be certainly, it's certainly something which we should be used in a complementary way. Um, yeah, and I guess uh, on the, uh, on, on our side, essentially, yes, there's, there's, there's actually a big potential, I think, um, at least in two areas. 
for application of machine learning uh, algorithms. One which we will be starting looking, I think, within the Pacer project itself, which is the uh, fragmentation uh, of these systems. One of the problems that we currently face is that in order to fragment systems, we need to have people who apply chemical intuition, look at the system and say, break this bond, break the other bond and so on. So I think that a big added value will be actually to use machine learning to have um, the algorithm itself, uh, the machine learning method trained to fragment the system. Um, and that's, that's also very nice because it will allow us to automate that procedure. For example, if you think in the future about a Venetian molecular dynamics and also those, those kind of things that could be extremely useful. Another area where I think machine learning could be useful is um, not uh, in getting really the bulk of the energy of these systems. Uh, that's really too hard to be fair and not even DFT sometimes manages to get it to that level of accuracy. Uh, but perhaps getting the differences of energies uh, between high levels of theory. So let's say you go up to a certain level of theory and you want to get the next. Uh, that's where there's, I think, uh, a very nice potential application as well. Okay, thank you, Giuseppe and Debra. I think it's probably time for final remarks of, of today. As I mentioned, uh, this is the first event of a series of events um, and we have upcoming um, events on all Tuesdays of June. So uh, we'll have a uh, PACERS uh, online seminar on computational fluid dynamics on the 15th of June, uh, particle and molecular physics on 22nd of June, and um, the seminar on radio astronomy projects on the 29th of June. Uh, registrations for those are, are now open. I would like to emphasize that um, we use those sessions to present um, present the projects and um, and the um, technical challenges and also research challenges in those projects, but also to make those uh, efforts that we uh, we have uh, a bit more accessible for all researchers. So it's, it's an opportunity for you to learn about um, what we are doing on the technical side and on the research side and. And, uh, and it's open for you also to, to, to contribute or to, um, to benefit from the work that is being done within, within those projects. Thank you again for, uh, to the presenters for, for the presentations and, 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 and great, uh, great discussion. And all the participants of today, uh, today's events have a great rest of the day and uh, we hope to meet you soon again online or, or in person. Thank you so much.